as per usual, I have to do two videos. Now, you know, I split them into two because I don't want to be uploading 40 minute videos. I don't expect people to do that. And then by doing two a day, it means that I'm, I'm backing up some, some content so that for people who are like, oh, I'll watch that when I get to it, they can go through and watch them in order uh, whenever they feel like it. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, of course, the question is going to be, well, what are you going to do when you're watching new movies? Well, it's simple. I'm going to, I'm going to do this list once a year. So I'll keep track of where I had everything. And then over the coming year, whatever movies I see that, like, for instance, Black Panther will probably end up being in this list. And then we'll go into the new countdown a year from now. Um, that being said, let's go right back into it. 130, X2, X-Men United. I think what I like about the X-Men series is that while there's good guys and bad guys, the bad guys do help the good guys at times because they have to. It is in their, their mutual in, mutual interests to help one another because humanity is scared of them and wants them gone. And X2 is a, is a very good movie. Um, it's long, though. Uh, one of the things that I felt kind of held X2 back is it's, it's a very long movie. For, for a superhero movie, it just felt... Uh, it really felt its length. And uh, there are some great performances put in in this movie. Uh, it, it gets completely undermined by uh, X-Men 3, the, the Last Stand, which was just crap. Absolute crap. And it's too bad, because X-Men was a good movie, X-2 was a good movie, and then X-Men 3, Here you go, you can't screw this up. I can too, mwahaha. And it... Yeah, uh, bad direction, bad writing, bad everything makes for a bad movie. And that's what X-Men 3 was. It was just a horrible movie. 129. Yvonne and I reviewed this one. The Frighteners. Uh, the Frighteners is uh, Ghostbusters, but on a different level and in a different way. And it's it's a uh, it's got its lighthearted moments, but it really is kind of a horror movie. It's kind of scary in parts. The ending in parts is terrifying. Um, for me, anyways, the Frighteners is uh, it's good enough to be here. I, I would put it ahead of every movie that's under it. Um, Rewatchability is okay. I mean, I watched it a couple months ago when I got it on Blu-ray, but. Uh, you know, it's again, it's it's kind of a poor man's Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters two isn't on this list, but Ghostbusters is. So I rated ahead ahead of Ghostbusters two just based on how silly Ghostbusters two finale really is. The climax is so silly. Uh, the Frighteners is not, and uh, I think the biggest problem is that when you've got somebody with the last name Busey as your villain, he's so over the top just based on his appearance. Anyways, it's pretty obvious that's where you're headed with the villain. Well, who's doing this? There's a Busey in it. He did it. One twenty-eight, A Christmas Carol. So when I had this set as a list of a hundred movies, I had Christmas Carol at one hundred, and there were a bunch of movies I was keeping out of the one hundred, and I was like, oh, I don't, I can't, I can't, not mention a Christmas Carol. Every year. For years, on, on Christmas Eve, I would stay up till midnight, not to see Santa Claus. I would stay up until midnight to watch this. CBC would play Christmas Carol, commercial-free, every year at midnight. And the Alistair Sim version from the 30s, and not the colorized crap either. The original black and white. Colorized is just so distracting. Um, Christmas Carol is wonderful. It's fantastic. And... Alistair Sim is just so good as Cranky. And then when he's the happy Scrooge, he is genuinely so funny. Um, I still laugh when I watch it in parts. I still watch it every year if I can if I can catch it. Uh, I prefer to watch it on TV. I don't really want to own my own copy. I'm weird that way. I'd rather, I'd rather go through the experience of watching on TV, but man, with commercials. And they don't do commercial-free movies on Christmas Eve, which is so weird now. Gotta have commercials in there. Gotta make our money. Um, Christmas Carol should be seen commercial free, so maybe I'll end up having to cave and buy my own copy. But uh, it it is just so glorious. It's been remade a bunch of times, and of course Scrooge is is another take on it. And uh, the Muppets have done Christmas Carol, which is entertaining. It's not on the list, but it is very entertaining. Uh, Rizzo the Rat's funny. Um, 
but the original Alistair Sim version for me is is just so heartfelt and so well done, and it is it is just awesome. One twenty seven. Part of the reason I went to two hundred movies is seeing this movie on TV a couple weeks ago, and you're going, you know what? Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home, the one with the whales, is actually a really good movie. Even if you're not a Star Trek fan, you can sit and watch Voyage Home and be very, very entertained. I mean, you'd find parts of it silly and confusing if you're not a Star Trek fan, but all of the 80s stuff is this perfect time capsule for the 80s when it appeared that humpbacks were going to be hunted to extinction. And now, thankfully, last I heard, and things change quickly in this world, that humpbacks had bounced back nicely and that their numbers were coming up. Um, and, and that's good because, you know, the, the death of all the whales would have been kind of sad. Uh, and that's an understatement. Uh, Star Trek Four was this beautiful, wonderful movie. Um, very well done. And uh, great performances all around. Uh, even by William Shatner. Shatner takes a lot of crap for uh, for his stopping mid-sentence and making everything really dramatic. Uh, he didn't really do that in the movies, though. Some some parts of Star Trek, Ra Star Trek Wrath of Khan, and I know people have fun with the whole Khan scream, but look at Star Trek Into Darkness, and you can see how bad a, a con scream is if you don't do it right. Um, spoilers. Uh, Star Trek Four is just this really cute movie, and it's good, because Star Trek Two Wrath of Khan is very dark and violent. Part Three is still dark and violent. Part Four is just fun. It's just like they went, you know what, we've put these actors through so much, we don't want to spend any real money on a budget. Hey, we'll just put them in the 80s. And, and when it's done wrong, it can be really, really bad. Dark Matter had an episode where they went back to our current... Uh, time in history and just it was awful so if you can do a time travel movie where you go back to present day from a science fiction era uh, hundreds of years in the future and you do it right I absolutely respect your work and this is one of those examples 126 I mentioned Kevin Smith before I'm going to mention Kevin Smith a lot as we move up the countdown Mallrats Mallrats is a fantastic movie um now, if you've seen it, uh, the actress that plays Trish, or as uh, Brody calls her, Trish the Dish, and she says, nobody calls me that. Um, she's the underage girl who uh, films herself having sex with older men. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's uh, something. Mallrats was... <laughs> Mallrats I loved when I first started watching it the first time, because I'm like, okay, Ben Affleck's playing a guy named Shannon. That's awesome! Shannon Hamilton, right on, and he scores Shannon Doherty awesome great that's fantastic oh he has sex with an underage girl oh no 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 of course he does and of course he's a jerk and he's picking fights with brody and he's just being an, an ass overall and i'm like of course because the guy named shannon of course he did that um but mole rats once you get past my arrogance and wanting to see my name on tv um or in or movies but in this case tv because i didn't see mole rats in the theater I haven't seen any Kevin Smith movie in the theater. To me, they're, they're, they're rentals. They're something you watch uh, at home. You don't go to a theater and watch a Kevin Smith movie. That's personally the way I've always approached it. They're good. If it's a Jay and Silent Bob universe movie, they're pretty good. And Mallrats is no exception. Mallrats is a fun movie. And it is... Uh, I cannot look at chocolate-covered pretzels the same since this movie. Never look at chocolate-covered pretzels the same again. Um... And, and if I meet somebody named Julie, my first thought is, is it Julie Doyer? Or are you going to die in the pool? Uh, because it's mentioned both Clerks and Mallrats, and they get more into it in Mallrats. Um, Mallrats, th there's nothing really to be taken seriously in this. Uh, there are so many great one-liners from, from Jay in this movie. And just the idea of guys hanging around a mall, I identified with that at the time because that's what I did a lot. Uh, I still enjoy going to the mall shopping and just hanging out for a while. And, and Mallrat shows how much fun that can be. And uh, some, some great work uh, by a, a lot of, of actors who would move on to bigger, better things after. Sadly, Renee Humphrey, who plays Trish the Dish in this movie, barely did anything after this movie. Um, I, I was a, a big fan of hers from other movies. There's a movie Jailbait she did, which is kind of sleazy, but at the same time, it's not as sleazy as the cover makes it look. Um, and, and the sex scenes, you can tell it's a body double that it's not her. Not because she was underage, but probably because she's like, look, this movie's a piece of crap. I'm not doing that. 
So you can get a body double. I'm not shooting those scenes. I'm out of there. Um, and she was also in a movie we're going to get to once we get to the top 100 called Fun. I'm going to devote a lot of time to that movie, so I'm just warning you guys now. Uh, she's a, a very good actress, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised that she she did that. So I'm guessing that she, she got married and had kids and settled down and decided that the Hollywood life wasn't for her. Because she was good looking, she was a good actress, and um, you, she could definitely play a very, very uh, number of roles, especially at the age she was at. So, um, highly recommend Mall Rats. 125. This is another one that was in the top 100, and I, I didn't feel comfortable having it in the top 100. Uh, they live. Uh, Roddy Piper was a half decent actor, uh, if, if you didn't mind uh, corny lines. Everybody panned Hulk Hogan movies, and rightfully so. I never heard a whole lot about Roddy Piper's movies being flagged as, as horrible because Piper was a guy that I always liked. So it's weird, you know, Piper's the guy you're supposed to hate because he's the bad guy wrestler, and I always liked him. And Hogan was the guy who's supposed to be this big American hero, and I couldn't stand him. Uh, so when They Live came out, I was like, Roddy Piper, main star in a movie? I've come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum? Wow. And there are so many good one-liners in this movie, and it's silly. It's low budget, but it, it, it has its creepy moments, and it has um, some characters you really enjoy. And when he's talking to the one woman about how ugly she is, when he puts on his glasses, oh, just, it, it is so exquisite, and it's pure Roddy Piper. Once he gets those glasses on and he starts talking to people, he's the wrestler. That's where the wrestler Roddy Piper starts, and whatever character he's playing before that just dies. Um, and then for the rest of the movie, he's, he's hot rod. There's, there's no way around it. He's hot rod. So for me, that movie belongs here. It was, it was, uh, very entertaining, uh, decent soundtrack, uh, and, and good mood. There's a good mood throughout the entire movie where, uh, the scenes and the, the settings really set the mood for the movie and, and you can believe it. You can believe in the ridiculous premise. So the idea that aliens control the world, which of course has gone away now. Oh, shame, Internet. Shame, shame, shame. Uh, 124 was also in the top 100. I was grateful when I went to the top 200 because there were movies that I had in the top 100 because I wanted to talk about them when I went to 200 before Sunrise gets in here. So you have Before Sunrise, which is the original, Before Sunset, which is the second one, and then Before Midnight, which is the fun finale, I assume. I assume they're not going to do a fourth um, because the third, the ending of the third is so uncomfortable. I do not recommend watching the third movie with your significant other if you have any tension between you. Uh, when I watched Before Midnight with my ex-wife, we were uh, we were in the last year of being together. And they have this big fight at the end between uh, Julie Delpy and, and, and uh, uh, Ethan Hawke that feels very familiar for a couple who've been together for a long period of time. And in our case, there were a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of things we didn't talk about between the two of us that got talked about between the couple. So if, if you're not wanting to live that kind of stuff, watch Before Sunrise, where they first meet. And what I like with Before Sunrise is it's a movie that's a conversation. Yeah, it's just the two of them. It's a conversation from the start of the movie to the end. There, Nothing else happens. So if you're waiting for explosions, go watch Armageddon. This isn't Armageddon. If you're waiting for sex, this isn't your movie either. They hint that maybe they have sex. They don't tell you what happened until the following movie. So until before sunset, you don't find out whether or not they actually had sex with each other. Um, and, and before sunrise, it, there's a lot of conversations about men and women and their roles. And the idea is this before sunrise shows them as, as young and, and, and passionate about things and gender roles being discussed stuff that is really kind of key right now, uh, with where we are in society before sunset shows them in their thirties, uh, when you've got regrets over the things you didn't do in your twenties. And then before midnight is more of, um, really hashing it out with all the crap you've done. And and there's a lot of crap that gets hashed out in that movie. Uh, so watch Before Sunrise when everything's happy. It's, uh, it's, it's a good idea. It's sort of like my idea of watching Friday the 13th movies backwards, because then it's a movie about Jason Voorhees going around to dead people and pulling machetes out of them, and he's a miracle worker. Thank you, Jason. Now we can all leave the camp alive. Uh, 123's Role Models. Um, 
Sean William Scott can be very, very funny. I hate American Pie. <laughs> and I, I know those two things don't sound like they go together. I hate the American Pie movies. I think they're crap. When the original American Pie came out, everybody was like, oh, this is so great. And I heard all of the, the, the big jokes, uh, this one time at band camp being the biggest one. Um, it was stupid. And I heard the, the this one time at band camp joke over and over and over, and I thought, that really isn't that funny. Uh, it's it's played for a larf, I guess, but it's, it's not funny. Uh, to me, funny is Pinky and the Brain. That's the word larf that I just used. Um, yeah, Pinky and the Brain is hilarious. American Pie isn't. And yet, Role Models is. Sean William Scott and Paul Rudd have a natural chemistry on screen that you believe they can be friends and hate each other at the same time. Uh, the kids they're paired up with in this movie uh, as big brothers after they get in some, some legal difficulty, and that's what they have to do as their community, community service, uh, they're paired up well. Um, and and it is a, a very entertaining way that they uh, weave this tale, and it kind of has an, an un, unusual ending. The ending doesn't feel um, like your standard Hollywood ending, and I like that. I like that there's there's some parts that are left open to interpretation, like, you know, he loves Beth, but are they really going to be back together, or is she just being nice to him because he learned a lesson? Later on, she's going to say, well, I love you, but we're still not it. Um, and Sean William Scott learns not a whole lot. Uh, he just... He just sticks to being himself, and eventually people are like, you know what? You're you, and you're good. Um, and, of course, uh, there's some scene stealing that goes on from the kids and the leader of Sturdy Wings um, and and the guy who talks about uh, Wings. It's that song, Wings, uh, you know, Take Me Down to the Streets, a song that doesn't exist. And they made it up for the movie, and for the soundtrack, they made sure that somebody who sounds like Paul McCartney Sounds like Paul McCartney sings the song "Take Me Down to the Streets." So they they make up a Wings song, and then at the end of the movie, they play the 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 song they made up for Wings. It it's really funny because you've had that argument with somebody, where they mention a song and they go, "Oh yeah, that's by so and so," and you go, "No, no, 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 no," and then they start singing, and you go, "Those lyrics are wrong." Do I need to put you through a window? The lyrics are wrong. That person didn't sing it. I don't know why you think Britney Spears sang Hell's Bells, but what you're singing is Jingle Bells. I'm going to put you through that window. Window, out you go. No, don't open the window. It's not fun that way. Uh, 122, I'm just going to write a word. And then I'm going to write three dots. Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, Last Crusade is not on my chart. Temple of Doom is not on my chart. As a kid, I like Temple of Doom more than Raiders. Absolutely. Although, the monkey brains, the bugs. I don't like bugs. I really hate bugs. Insects really creep me out. A spider's not a problem. Spiders, I'm good. I'm good with spiders. I'll carry a spider around. No problem. I'm fine. Tarantula, whatever. But bugs bother me. So, uh, Temple of Doom. I, I think as a kid, I had a huge crush on Kate Capshaw, and that might have blinded me to what else was in the movie. But And there's, there's some subtle racism in there. <laughs> it's subtle in Temple of Doom. But if you really pay attention and you really look in between the sheets and, and look at what lays in between there, you might notice a little bit of racism in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. So much so that you can't watch it when you're an adult. Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's still some of that which comes from just how these tales are told. But it is it is a great movie. And, and this was where Harrison Ford stopped just being Han Solo. Um, and Harrison Ford showed some more range, I think, as, as Indy than he did as, as Han Solo. Uh, and I think... For Harrison Ford, and I'm just, just projecting, I think it was important not to just be Han Solo and to be able to do something in between Star Wars movies that was different. And this was definitely different. Raiders was a lot of fun. Um, and the Indiana Jones character in movies that are written right where uh, they don't use a fridge to protect against a nuclear explosion. Monkeys. It's with the monkeys. Why are you doing this to Indiana Jones? Watch Raiders, because much like Before Sunrise, it's before all the ugliness happens. Um... Raiders is, is, is fantastic, and it's unflinching in its violence. You look at some of the violence in it now, and you're like, wow, that, that might be rated R today, or rated PG-13, or oh, that's that's kind of violent. Yeah, um, and it was PG back then, and people understood it was a swashbuckling tale. This is kind of how swashbuckling tales work. Um, so we'll, we'll see how um, 
you guys react to that, but I have Raiders at 122, and I know there's people who would have it much higher. I'm, I'm well aware there are people who would have it much higher. And finishing off today's movies, which is February 11th, so I don't know when you're, when you're watching this, but February 11th, 2018 is when I'm doing this. Uh, this is a movie that uh, I really, really like. And I really like the energy between the brothers. I really desperately love Dana Delaney in this movie. Uh, Dana Delaney, of course, was the most beautiful woman in Hollywood at the time, and she's still a very good-looking woman now. Um, I would still sit down and have coffee with her. Uh, Tombstone, though, is not about her or Billy Zane's wonderful hair in the movie, which you have to wonder, looking at just a couple years later, was that a wig? Because he's he doesn't have hair, really, later on. And Titanic, it was clear he was wearing a wig in parts, and at the very least, he had a toupee to cover parts. And um, Tombstone is glorious. Uh, Kurt Russell, when he's angry, is fantastic. And in Tombstone, he he just takes it to that next level. And the way that the, the cowboys are written, this this is what I wish all Westerns were. Um, something that's that's a little more human and down to, and, and less cartoony. A lot of Westerns I start watching, I'm like, eh, this is cartoony, and I, I turn it off. Um, because the Wild West wasn't really the Wild West. It wasn't that str that that bad. Tombstone, I think they try to make it a little more realistic. And, uh, boy, there are so many good performances in this. Um, and, and there's, there's a death that takes place that, that why it's really upset about, man, you feel it. You absolutely feel it. Um, it, it is such a tremendous movie. And again, if, if you haven't seen any movie that I talk about on this chart, I am absolutely recommending it, uh, right down to the number 200. That's why I'm doing this. So the people who, you know, in this digital age, you lose some of these movies, uh, hopefully this, this causes people to seek some out that might be gathering dust digitally somewhere else. And Tombstone's one of those movies. It's just great. And remember, I don't like westerns. I love Tombstone. Um, I can sit and watch Tombstone from front to back. And the, the funny thing with Tombstone is I've talked about the running time of other movies. Tombstone is not a short movie. But it is so well done. And it slowly ratchets up the tension little bit by little bit. By, and then... By the time you reach that end, by the time you reach the big fight, you're like, wow, this is awesome. And, of course, Val Kilmer steals every scene he's in. I'm your Huckleberry. And done. Every woman in the crowd melts into a puddle on the floor. Uh, it's it's just great. Uh, Tombstone, I, I cannot recommend enough. Um... And, and there you go. There's the next 10. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. I'll know if you forgot. I have ways of finding out. The internet tells me everything. Um, and yeah. Uh, the like and subscribe buttons are right there. You might as well push them while you're here. And uh, I'll talk to you again soon.